Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Wednesday, August the 26th, 2020. The agent says that uh, she's just, they just talked to the boss in New Mexico. Uh And that he says that you must hold out. That uh, uh, just hold on until after the election. Now, uh, uh, we know what you is saying to them out there. Yeah. We, we are, we're pretty well informed on both ends. Yeah. Uh, Nixon's man traveling with him today said, uh, quote, that uh, he did not understand that you was not aboard. Yeah. Did you see that? Did you see that? Uh, no, I don't think I did. Who was that, Harlow? Uh, we don't know. We have no idea. Uh, he speaks through these unknown people. Yeah. Now, we told uh, Nixon, as we told you, uh, that... Uh, well, let me get the transcript. Uh, while this was going on, we went out to Chew and talked to him and all of our allied countries. And they all tentatively agreed. Yeah. Now, since that agreement, we have had problems develop. First, there's been speeches that we ought to withdraw troops. Yeah. That was Humphrey and uh, uh, Bundy. Yeah. Or that we stop bombing without any obtaining anything in return. Yeah. Or some of our folks including some of the old China lobby, are going to the Vietnamese embassy and saying, please notify the president that if he'll hold out to November the 2nd, they could get a better deal. Uh Now, I'm reading their hand, Everett. I don't want to get this in the campaign. That's right. And they oughtn't to be doing this. This is treason. I know. That was a conversation via telephone between... LBJ, and Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen, a Republican. That conversation was held on October the 31st, Halloween, in 1968, one of the most turbulent years in the history of this country. Why do I play that excerpt from that 10-minute conversation? Well, it is connected to the Republican National Convention. I'll give you more context on why, plus a look at night two of the RNC right after this. President Trump gets things done. They are delivering every day on their promise to make America great again. Join us as I grant John, I'm not sure you know this, a full pardon. Our entire economy and dairy farming are once again roaring back. There's a housing boom, there's an auto boom, a manufacturing boom, a consumer spending boom. We simply cannot endure a Biden-induced recession. He'll be controlled by the environmental extremists. Biden is too weak, too scared, and too sleepy to stand up to the radical left. Democrats tried to make faith organizations pay for abortion-inducing drugs. He has done more for the unborn than any other president. We must all embrace our First Amendment rights and not hide in fear of the media. Stand up and fight the socialists poisoning our schools and burning our cities. We all know about Joe's son, Hunter Biden, yet he was paid millions to do nothing. My father does not run away from challenges, even in the face of outright hatred. Let us join our president in his vow that America will never be a socialist country. Congratulations. You're now citizens of the United States of America. This president has led bold initiatives in nearly every corner of the world. Peace in the Middle East. Never-ending wars were finally ended. Promises made and promises for the first time were kept. If you tell him he cannot be done, he just works harder. Donald? 
I believe that we need my husband's leadership now more than ever in order to bring us back once again to the greatest economy and the strongest country ever known. Welcome back. That was a mashup of night number two of the Republican National Convention last night. And really what you really need to know about night number two was that it was full of a parade of lies and a parade of Orwellian speak and a parade of propaganda. And that's really what we are talking about. Trump propaganda. And a grotesque evisceration of the kinds of norms and protocols that the United States government has been going through now for well over 244 years. 244 years now. There has been protocol in place. Things that you're not supposed to do while you're in the White House. In other words, campaigning from the White House. There are certain officials whom do that will violate the Hatch Act. And apparently the commander in chief is exempt from that act. But it makes what he does no less scurrilous. And last night, Donald J. Trump absolutely pimped the White House and pimped America with what was a, another disgraceful display of self-indulgence, narcissism, and also a grotesque level of disrespect for the office that he is tenuously sitting in, for the White House that is actually the people's house, and for the country at large, and for you and me as taxpayers in this country. Donald Trump was holding a naturalization ceremony in the White House, a profoundly disrespectful thing, using the individuals, all of whom were either black or brown, as political props for his campaign to stay in the White House. It was so distasteful. And to see an acting Homeland Secretary Chad Wolf, who it was found by the General Accounting Office, a nonpartisan group, who determined and found that Chad Wolf was illegally installed as the acting Department of Homeland Security chief. So, based on the GAO, again, they are a nonpartisan group. Chad Wolf is in his office illegally. And I tweeted this at the popcorn R-E-E-L last night during the can- convention, during the moment where I saw this ha- where this was happening. Technically speaking, every one of those five or six people who had been sworn in were not technically citizens because if the person swearing them in has been illegally installed to that position, then by its very definition, any and everything that derivates from them has no force or legal effect whatsoever. And that would include swearing in people to be newly minted American citizens. So not only was Donald Trump using these five or six individuals as political props in the most disgraceful way, using people as props by having them in a ceremony. But they may not really be citizens, even though they've been handed their certificates and everything else. And quite frankly, I don't even know if they were already citizens and they were using and acting out their reenactments of their swearing in. I mean, nobody brought that up at all on any of the news channels that these people could all have already been sworn in beforehand and were just reenacting that in the White House 
I mean, I just think in either way, you, any way you cut it, it's just despicable. And there was also no physical distancing, no masks, no nothing. And Donald Trump standing there puffing out his chest. And he looked more orange than usual. For those of you who saw it, did you notice that? He looked far more orange than usual. And the irony of that swearing in ceremony, by the way, is that there are hundreds of thousands of people, literally, who, many of whom look like the individuals that you may have seen at the ceremony, who are trying to get the very same ceremony. In fact, they're trying to get it done via Zoom. And yet Donald Trump and his administration will not allow any of those thousands of individuals who are black and brown, to get that ceremony. Why? He doesn't want them to vote during the election in November because he knows there's a chance that some of them may vote against him and vote for Joe Biden. And they don't want that at the Trump administration. So Donald Trump certainly doesn't want that. So instead of doing the principal thing, which is to not be political when you're dealing with these kinds of matters, what does Donald Trump do? He goes political. And every single thing this guy does is with some kind of political calculus to it. Some transactional calculus. How does it benefit me? I mean, that's really the story of this guy. There's always political calculating going on. And that ceremony was despicable last night. As was State Secretary of State Mike Pompeo speaking in Jerusalem to do a campaign video from there for the RNC. I mean, this is really disgusting. That violates the very Secretary of State's own laws and protocol. I mean, it's just outrageous, quite frankly. Joy Reid, by the way, on MSNBC, spoke to this very issue about this use of the office and quite frankly as i say and as i as i've said before donald trump is a pimp he absolutely pimped the white house and he absolutely desecrated it and in doing that he desecrated you and me because that's our house and joy reed talked about this actually in her analysis last night i'm going to play that right now for you to listen to you had donald trump uh also using the white house i I was really struck tonight and i have to say not in a good way by the use and in my view misuse of the white house they surrounded themselves with the trappings of the power that in theory they were given by the american people these are not monarchs this is not their property um You know, this was not an episode of Cribs. I I didn't need Melania Trump strolling down, you know, the galleyway as if she'd just come from the living room in her home. Um, But they use the, they they have used the property of the American people, these sacred properties that are owned by the American people for politics tonight in a way that I think is offensive, um, I think is wrong. Um, the, and I was particularly as bad as, as, as this felt to me, I have to be honest. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a fan of Melania Trump. I think the birtherism thing really sticks in my craw in a way I can't get out. Um, but even worse, I think, was the naturalization ceremony that really stuck out to me tonight as the thing that is staying with me as I walk away from this. I mean, my mother did that ceremony. You know, when my mother came from Guyana, she was here for about 16 years before she um, became a naturalized American citizen. And that ceremony has such deep meaning for the people who become Americans. Donald Trump made that ceremony about him. He made that ceremony about celebrating Donald Trump. He did that ceremony inside of the White House when, as Jacob Soboroff reported tonight, other people who want to become citizens are being denied access to that ceremony. He's denying access to that ceremony to all of these other people, and he did one specifically for politics, specifically for his reelection. He used those people as props. 
He used people that would be from the S-hole countries he would not let into this country. People who look like those people, who have the religions perhaps of those people, people from, that are brown like those people, are barred from getting into the United States. They're not allowed to come in because they're not from Norway. But Donald Trump used a color collection, a um, sort of crayon box of colors tonight to try to paint a false image of himself as welcoming to immigrants and welcoming to black people and brown people. It was offensive to see that done in the people's house. That the naturalization ceremony is a sacred thing to a new American. It is not about Donald Trump. And he made it about Donald Trump. And he used the people's house to, to, to sort of, you know, play politics with. That's not a Barbie's dream house. That's the American people's house. Is Joy Reid is absolutely right. And with the Donald Trump and all of his family doing what they've been doing these first two days, they're showing you who they are. Maya Angelou once said, when someone shows you who they are, Believe them the first time. And Donald Trump and his family have shown you exactly who they are. Grifters, thieves, criminals, period. Donald Trump does not want to leave office. He's going to. When we defeat him in November, now we've got to vote and vote right now. Well, you'll be able to start really voting next week when the early voting comes. But do not procrastinate. I urge you. I will have that list of states coming up um, by week's end. You know, it's taken a lot longer because there's a lot of detail. Um, but I do uh, uh, want to say that that will be ready at weekend. Um, and I really will start to distribute that because it's very important that people um, start educating themselves now on voting. Now, now, now. Because when you see this convention, and I know a lot of people are not watching the Republican convention um, compared to the Democratic convention through the first two nights or through the first night, um, the Democratic convention had at least three and a half million more viewers or so, um, according to a study. And I forget which one is it, Pew Research or something, an impartial, um, nonpartisan group. So, you know, that shows you that people have more interest in what the Democrats are saying and who um, they intend to govern with because, you know, again, we're moving into the 21st century. We're into the 21st century. And as Joe Biden has said, we want this cabinet and this um, ticket to look more like America. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, there were just lots of other things on the night that were highly offensive last night in night number two of the Republican National Convention, whether it was an anti-abortion activist saying some really heinous things, quite frankly. I mean, these folks are frightening. If someone is anti-abortion, then that's their prerogative. If someone is for abortion, then that's their prerogative. But what I have a problem with is people who say all of these very violent things. Instead of just saying, well, you know, this is my position and it's, it's very difficult. Why is there this need to go into this very graphic detail? I just, I even tweeted out what this anti-abortion activist said. I'm not going to repeat it here, but you can find it if you really want to know what she said um, on my Twitter feed for Wednesday, August the 26th, that would have been yesterday. Excuse me, that would have been today, but uh, yesterday, 25th, <laughs> the 25th of, of August, Tuesday. You can find, you can find the tweet on my Twitter feed at the popcorn, R-E-E-L, on August the 25th, that's the date of the tweet, and you'll see it. I'm not going to repeat what she said here, but it's very graphic. It was very graphic. And I just really, I know that the Republican Party can be repugnant and are in a great many respects, but to allow that speech to hit air, I am really surprised. I was surprised that they let that speech go. And it was verified, and uh, excuse me, it was vetted and proofread. I mean, how on earth did that speech get on primetime television? 
So there was that. There was Rand Paul lying his ass off. There were the Trumps being disgusting and a complete bunch of bold-faced liars, including Melania Trump, who was the keynote speaker. She went on toward the end of the night and was, you know, in the Rose Garden giving the speech. And there was what, about 60 people in these chairs. They were poorly lit. It was, you know, it was in the darkness. You could barely see these individuals. There was no physical distancing, no masks. Maybe I, I counted only four people out of close to, what, 80 people sitting there who had masks on, only three or four. I mean, it was abysmal. And apart from the one moment where the first lady of this country, God, geez, I really hesitate to say that about Melania Trump because she's a racist. She subscribes to this Bertha nonsense, and I hate that word because you should just be calling her a racist, not Bertha. That doesn't tell you anything. She's a racist, and there's records showing it. So Melania Trump, I mean, my gosh, you know, it's just, it's just ridiculous. Just sat there, stood there and lied and desecrated the office as well. And Trump did, you know, her husband did. And she lied about him being, oh, he's a genuine man, an honest man. My ass. How can you say he's genuine and honest when he cheated on you? He cheated on you. Literally days after you'd given birth to Baron. And he went behind your back and had it off with a porn star. And he just paid the porn star off this week. I think legal fees or some taxes or some whatever owed. Claire McCaskill, the senator, the former senator out of Missouri talked about it. Listen, listen to this. Listen to how she felt about this. Yeah, I I have to take a deep breath here because I'm hopping mad. I'm just furious. I am furious at this little small man trashing the people's house with his narcissism and his ego, using those people that were becoming American citizens as props. And by the way, he's the most anti-immigrant president in the history of our country. I hope journalists are busy right now because I guarantee you there's somebody in that group that would not be allowed in this country under this president's policies. You know, it is just infuriating that he has blown up the Hatch Act like this and that all these people think these rules don't apply to them. Who do they think they are? It is just infuriating. And by the way, Melania Trump, let me give her credit. She at least said for the first time anybody in this White House has ever said how badly she feels for the families who have lost a loved one to COVID. But let's be real about whether or not she's really going to help him with with women in the suburbs. They know what the deal is here. Uh, They've all defended husbands publicly. This is a woman whose husband had to pay court costs this week because he paid off a porn star because he was having sex behind her back with a porn star right after she gave birth to their son. Give me a break. I am done with this guy. Oh, sorry. So that was Senator, former Senator, I should say, Claire McCaskill, a Democrat from Missouri, giving her opinion about what went on at the Republican National Convention on Tuesday night. Now, look, I think that it was despicable. I think last night was despicable. There were so many norms violated, so many American government protocols violated, the rules and regulations violated. It was disgusting to watch and infuriating, as you heard Senator McCaskill quite quite rightly say. It was infuriating to watch because in a way you're helpless to it because these are the people in power. And they're absolutely flouting the rules. They're trampling the rules, which is what the stated goal was. Steve Bannon talked about this, wanting to deconstruct the administrative state. And Donald Trump and the administration he is supposedly running, and he's not, have largely succeeded in doing this. And if you give them four more years, this place will be in tatters. I mean, it already is to a degree, but my goodness, you will not recognize this country. You won't even realize that your social security benefits have gone. Disability benefits, retirement benefits. That's what Donald Trump wants to take an axe to. 
You don't believe me? Well, listen to this from Lawrence O'Donnell. They arrived with the greatest economy uh, you could possibly ask for when uh, Donald Trump entered the White House. Larry Kudlow and Donald Trump had nothing to do with energizing that economy. Larry Kudlow did, again tonight, mention the Trump plan to cut Social Security taxes. And we just had the breaking news last night that I mentioned here was that the chief actuary of Social Security has said if the Trump plan goes into effect... Six months into the next presidency, 2021, six months in, disability payments would stop and they would stop forever. The trust funds would be incapable thereafter of paying any disability. Retirement benefits would stop in 2023, halfway through the year, forever if the Trump plan goes into effect. That's part of what was inside Larry Kudlow's speech tonight. Now, what you just heard from Lawrence O'Donnell should truly send a chill down your spine. Social Security is on the verge of being destroyed, and that's really the shorthand of what Lawrence O'Donnell said in that clip. And he laid out when that would happen if this Trump plan goes through. And of course, the executive order that he signed a few, what, three weeks ago now? Which called for a scrap in the payroll tax, which is another way of saying cut Social Security and Medicaid and and Medicare. I mean, this is a very critical issue. And this whole convention is about projection and scamming people into believing that somehow Donald Trump cares about the country when he clearly doesn't or that Donald Trump cares about the working person. He clearly doesn't. He doesn't care about seniors either. He wouldn't be cutting back on Social Security if he did care about seniors. He wouldn't be refusing to use the Defense Production Act in its full authority if he really cared about human beings and if he really cared about the people in this country who are suffering. The only person Donald Trump cares about is himself and that's barely on any good day I mean I mean seriously he's not somebody who should be in power people have had enough what people have to do is vote early at the first opportunity that voting is available early make sure you avail yourself of it because we can't have more of this gaslighting this propaganda And these pathological lies. It's really propagandistic. It really truly is. Using people as props. Using the White House as a prop. Violating laws set by the Secretary of State. I mean, how much law breaking can you live with? What Donald Trump is doing is bombarding you. Hoping that you will mentally submit to all of the law breaking and gaslighting and the lies he is throwing at you. This is all designed all designed to get you mentally tired, physically exhausted, and to just kind of give up and give in and go, oh, I can't do this anymore. And there are some people perhaps who are feeling that way right now. They're being bombarded and barraged. There's so much going on. You know, I know of somebody or saw kind of cross a tweet um, that talked about that that didn't blatantly say this, but suggested that they weren't perhaps going to participate in the general election. Well, to anybody who is thinking, well, you know, both of them are the same. I'm not going to vote at all. Please refute that suggestion and just get it out of your mind and focus on voting. We can't afford to have people sitting on the fence or declaring, well, they're both the same, which is not true. When you've got an election this enormous at stake. Anyone who's undecided, in my opinion, is a Donald Trump supporter. And there are not many undecideds out there, not nearly as much as four years ago. So, I mean, this is serious stuff now. This convention was, again, this convention is going to be like this for the next two days. Today and tomorrow, closing things out. And thank God, you know, 
But, I mean, Donald Trump's appeared on both nights so far, and there's nothing to suggest that he's not going to appear in person again tonight. But this has been an absolute shitstorm, this convention for the Republicans. So much going on around it. There was some QAnon follower or someone who believed in QAnon who had tweeted some anti-Jewish, you know, anti-Semitic stuff out. And it was literally less than an hour before she was going to speak. Before someone in that criminal party, the Trump party, saw it fit to say, oh, maybe there's something wrong here. Uh, I think I'm going to take a look at this because this is really something I should read. I mean, it's just crazy. It's just crazy. I'll be right back. I just read you what I told him. Yeah. And I took with the confidential assurances given the three major candidates by Johnson. Uh -huh. We had the impression that all the diplomatic ducks were in a row, said the next the thought that somebody ought to be notified as to what's happening. Yeah. Here's the here's the Nixon release. A highly placed aide to Nixon said today, the South Vietnamese decision to boycott the Paris talks did not jive with the confidential assurances given the three major candidates by Johnson. Uh -huh. We had the impression that all the diplomatic ducks were in a row, said the Nixon associate. Yeah. I just read you what I told him. Yeah. And I told you that, and I told everybody else. Johnson got Nixon, Democratic candidate Humphrey, and third-party hopeful Wallace on a conference call about the bombing. Yeah. The advisor, Nixon's advisor, volunteered the GOP's candidate's reaction on the condition that he not be identified. Uh -huh. Nixon said the advisor felt that Saigon's refusal to attend the negotiation could jeopardize the military and the diplomatic situation in Vietnam yeah. and reflect the credibility of this administration. Yeah. Now, I can identify them because I know who's, who's doing this. I don't want to identify it. I think it would shock America if a principal candidate was playing with a, a source like this uh, on a matter this important. Yeah. I don't want to do that. Yeah. But if they're going to put this kind of stuff out, uh, they ought to know that, uh, uh, that, that we know what they're doing. I know who they're talking to, and I know what they're saying. Yeah. And my judgment is that Nixon ought to play it just like he has all along, that I want to see peace come the first day we can, that it's not going to affect the election one way or the other. The conference is not even going to be held until after the election. Yeah. Uh, they have stopped shelling the cities. Yeah. They have uh, stopped uh, going across the DMZ. Yeah. Uh, we've had uh, we've had 24 hours of relative peace. Yeah. Now, if Nixon keeps the South Vietnamese away from the conference, yeah. well, that's going to be his responsibility. Up to this point, that's why they're not there. Yeah. I had them signed on board until this happened. Yeah. That was, again, another portion of a conversation, a really important conversation, actually, between President Lyndon Baines Johnson and the Senate Minority Leader Everett Dirksen on Halloween of 1968. Now, the reason why I've been playing these excerpts of this conversation, actually it was a 10-minute phone conversation as far as I know here, about 10 minutes long, 10 minutes long, is because this ties in, believe it or not, to what we're seeing now with these flouting of norms. Now, never, ever has someone in the White House flouted the kinds of, generally speaking, the kinds of protocols like the ones that were flouted last night, having the Secretary of State tape a political message while doing his duty on behalf of the public in Jerusalem. I mean, that's just, that is not supposed to be happening because you're not acting on behalf of an individual in a campaign capacity. You're supposed to be, and you are working in public service on behalf of the whole country. 
and to do some kind of political speech for the purposes of aiding someone's election into the White House is just thoroughly unacceptable and repugnant. And it's something that is not done. There are clear delineations between the two. And so this phone call in 1968 was about treason and about how Richard Nixon, who was a private citizen at the time that he'd been in government before, but he was a private citizen in the sense that he was, he's a public figure, but private in the sense that he is not holding any government office. He was running to recapture the White House or to capture it because he had lost narrowly to Kennedy in 1960 and he would try again in 1968. Again, an incredibly turbulent year. One of the most turbulent years, calendar years, that the United States has ever had as the United States. And of course, you know, there's years that involved the Civil War that were turbulent. I'm not saying 1968 was the only year that was turbulent. I'm certainly not saying that. But it was a very turbulent year in, in the history of this country. And so in that spirit, there was a conversation literally on the 31st of October of that year, 1968, literally five days before the general election, November 5th, 1968. And Everett Dirksen, who was the Senate Minority Leader for the Republicans, and LBJ, the Democratic President, were having this telephone conversation about what was going on in the world. And of course, in 1968, what was going on in the world, certainly in part of the world, was the Vietnam War, the conflict between Vietnam and, you know, the United States. And I mean, this, this is a huge situation, a war that had been prolonged, a war that had become unpopular at home in the United States. And there you had Richard Nixon committing treason. You heard it on the first excerpt that I played that LBJ said, you know, that's treason. Nixon trying to undercut and scuttle the peace talks in Paris. And he was able to do just that in order to get a better deal for the South Vietnamese and to therefore hold off on any further negotiations in Paris and leave the table and walk away. And Nixon got them to do that through Anna Chenault. Anna Chenault was an Asian woman who had a lot of influence and power. She was able to um, get Richard Nixon to um, see her value and her worth. And she was someone who was a political operative, uh, I think a spy of some sorts as well, a spy of sorts. But she was somebody who was a very valued person who was able to speak to the South Vietnamese and force them away from the table. And it was at Nixon's behest. And Nixon was still in the midst of running for president at the time. He was literally a week, just a week, or less than a week away from a general election. And he was going to take on Hubert Humphrey because, as you know, just in case you don't know, though, LBJ had, in March of that same year of 1968, declared that he would not accept the Democratic nomination for president. And he's not seeking it. So he made it very clear. He's going to be one and done. He's not going to run again for the office no matter what. And, you know, he's, you know that, that's what happened. And Nixon was single-handedly destroying the peace talks. The war in Vietnam could have ended a whole lot earlier. As it stood, Nixon ended up winning the election because of all the chaos in 68 Law and order, the Chicago Convention with the Democratic National Convention being held there, the unrest, of course, all over the country because of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Of course, there was also um, that same year, literally a couple of months later, RFK was assassinated. I mean, 1968 was an incredible year. I mean, my goodness, to say the very least. And so there's so there's a lot going on. And then Nixon scuttled those talks and he got in amidst a amidst a polarized electorate winning the uh, winning the election by just about one percent or so I mean it's very very close between Nixon and Humphrey very close 
Very close indeed. And then, you know, of course, um, with Nixon in the White House, he wielded a lot of power and started to bend things to his will. Then the Watergate scandal came up and the Watergate break-in, and that led to his impeachment. And Well, he didn't get impeached, but it led to him having to resign because the votes were there, not only to impeach him, but also to remove him in the Senate. And Barry Goldwater's infamous march into the Oval Office and telling Nixon that, hey, look, you know, you're, you're pretty much a goner here. You know, people are not going to support you. You're going to lose, Mr. President. You're going to lose. And Nixon, hearing that, wasted very little time. The day after that, or the same night, he ended up announcing that he was going to resign the following day at noon, effective tomorrow. And boom, and what happened? He was re- he resigned. But with with all of that said, this guy is not resigning, and there's no telling whether he's going to leave peacefully or not. The chances are he won't if he loses in, what, 69 days? And I'm thinking that it's going to be a little bit more than 69 days because there's going to be some, um, obviously, um, a lot of people are going to be voting in person. Some of them are going to be sending in ballots. Some of them are going to miss the the dates or they're going to send them in too late or whatever. And that could be a potential issue. It will be. So we've got to start educating each other now. But as for um, Nixon, I mean, Nixon was traitorous. That's a traitor's move. When you try to scuttle peace talks for the country, you try to uh, get in favor, curry favor with a foreign government uh, with the purpose of actually interfering with U.S. foreign policy and you're interfering, even if it means you're doing something to get a good good ends out of it, it's not wise. And it is treasonous, really. I mean, Nixon committed treason. And yet he was still elected. I mean, this is... um, But I don't know. I mean, this is... It's a problem. And Nixon is not the first one to do these things. I mean, we've had this with Reagan as well. Um, doing the very same thing. I mean, there was no Vietnam War when Reagan was running in 1980, but there was a Vietnam War when he ran in 76, and that really fractured convention amongst the Republican Party in California. That was really fractured. And so Reagan ran again, and he did the same thing that Nixon did, except it was with Iran this time, and Reagan said, hold off, hold off on a deal for these hostages. I guarantee you, um, I'm thinking that the Americans are going to vote me in as soon as they do. Just hold off until after the election and I'll be grateful, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, look what happened. So exactly. I mean, Reagan too, you know. And the the thing is, is that the hostages were released after the election. Reagan was perceived as the one who had done things to facilitate that and boom. He was in power in 1980 after the Carter sold single term. And so th- this whole thing is just... <sighs> I don't know. All of this is to say, I guess, that history is very important. And when you tie these things together, although it's very clear that Donald Trump has taken an axe to a lot of the norms and democratic, small-d democratic institutions that we've taken for granted for almost 245 years now. Um, it's, you know, it's really something that's very visceral. And then you have to connect that to what's going on before, what happened before, what's going on in your area, uh, what news stories you're listening to, because this is happening not just in a microcosm, but it's a macrocosm. And you see what's happening to the country. Everybody's on edge. And, you know, that's... You know, we need to start focusing on voting, you know. I mean, it's difficult to focus on that when you're so uptight and so uh, pent up with emotion and and you're so, you know, you don't know what to do with yourself. But we need to go get away from that kind of a day and we need to make a new day for the country. And we, I mean, we've seen this treason thing, by the way, not just with even Reagan or 
Nixon, also W. Bush. I mean, my goodness me, I mean, going into Iraq like that, I mean, that's just disgusting, you know? And it was just really disgusting. Still paying a price. I mean, it's just disgusting. I mean, all of this stuff, it's just, it's just incredible to me. And the Republicans have a long history of it. And that's another reason why I played that tape. You had this, also this, to, to also illustrate this contrast in the way that political parties in this country work together or don't. You clearly had LBJ, the Democratic president in 68, um, working with Everett Dirksen, the popular and famous Republican who was the minority leader of the Senate, and they worked together. And you saw, you heard their conversations very casual. And I mean, we don't have anything like that anymore in this country. And uh, we need to get that. We need to reclaim that. And I think the best way to reclaim a lot of that is through voting this November. Tell your friends, tell everyone to early vote. Please do. I think you'd be glad you did. Well, now, what do you think we ought to do about it? Well, I'd better get in touch with him, I think. And tell him about it. I think you better tell him that his people are saying to these folks that uh, they oughtn't to go through this meeting. Now, if they don't go through the meeting, it's not going to be me that's heard. I think it's going to be whoever's elected, and it'd be my guess, him. Yeah. And I think they're making a very serious mistake, and I don't want to... I don't want to uh, say this. Yeah. And you're the only one I'm going to say it to. Yeah. I understood they were in Texas tonight. I don't, I don't know. All I know is that uh, uh, I read you what I told him on uh, the three candidates, just as I told you. Yeah. I said, now, uh, there has been speeches that some we ought to withdraw troops. And including some of the old China crowd that are going in and implying to the embassies. Yeah. Now, Everett, I know what happens there. You see what I mean? Yeah, I do. And I'm looking at his whole card. Yeah. Now, I don't want to get in a fight with him there. Uh, I think Nixon's going to be elected. Yeah. And I think we ought to have peace. And I'm going to work with him. Yeah. I've worked with you. Yeah. But I don't want these sons of bitches like Laird giving out announcements like this that Johnson gave him the wrong impression. Yeah. I gave him the right impression, except I gave it to him decently, yeah. uh, when I said that uh, uh, you ought to keep the Ms. Chenoffs and all the rest of them from running around here. Yeah. Now, you see, I know what Q says to his people out there. Yeah. I, I didn't see Laird. Well, I don't, I don't know who it is that's with Nixon. It may be Laird, it may be Harlow, it may be uh, Mitchell. I don't know who it is. I know this, that they're contacting... A foreign power in the middle of a war. That's a mistake. And it's a damn bad mistake. Oh, now, I don't want to say so. And you're the only man that I have enough confidence in yeah. to tell them. But you better tell them they better quit playing with it. And the day after the election, I'll sit down with all of you and try to work it out and be helpful. Yeah. But they oughtn't, to, they oughtn't to knock out this conference. Wherever they are, I'll get, try to get a hold of them tonight. Well, there are two things that they ought to do. One is... They ought to stop this business about trying to keep the conference from taking place. Yeah, exactly. It takes place the day after the election. Exactly. The second thing is, we can all sit down and talk about it uh, uh, after that time. And I'm not, I'm not a bitter partisan here, and you know it. I know. Well, I'll try to find a way over the yard tonight. Well, you just tell them that their people are messing around in this thing, and if they don't want it on the front pages, yeah. they better quit it, number one. Yeah. Number two, they, 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 we better sit down and talk about it uh, as soon as this thing's over with, and we'll try to work out a... That's right. And they ought to in, in tell their people that are contacting these embassies to yeah. go on with the conference. Right. Okay. I agree. Thank Welcome back. History is important. And we now see Donald Trump doing the same kinds of things that Ronald Reagan did, that W did, and you know, W. Bush, and also Nixon. 
I mean, this is treasonous. You know, Donald Trump has already done a couple of treasonous things, at least two or three already, uh, well, throughout his term. One of them, of course, was sharing classified secrets that the U.S. had, intelligence secrets or whatever secrets they were, with Russian officials inside the White House who had visited. He left the, let the American press outside and he allowed only the Russian press to come in. People already forget that. And that was August of 2017. And he shared all kinds of classified secrets with the Russians. Trump did this in the, in the Oval Office. With these two guys right there with him, these two Russians. I mean, it's just incredible. But this has been going on for such a long time, you know, not to mention the Iraq, the Ukraine stuff that you got impeached for. Definitely treasonous what he was doing there, colluding with a foreign power, trying to get dirt on Joe Biden. I mean, it's just. So anyway, anyway. Uh, there's so much going on. I mean, I'm I'm just, by the way, heartbroken. And there's nothing more to say about the RNC from night number two. It was just despicable, honestly. It is difficult to watch. And I know MSNBC, once again, cut into their broadcast on a number of occasions to fact check. Um, because there was a lot that needed to be fact checked, quite frankly. My goodness gracious me. It was really that appalling. You know, but who knows? We'll, we'll find out what happens and. You know, it's just, what a time we're living in, man. And poor, my goodness gracious me, Jacob Blake, paralyzed, as I alluded to in the episode last night. You know, this guy is now paralyzed. And his family, of course, are hoping that it's temporary paralysis, you know, as am I. But, you know, this is... Very difficult stuff. Um, these cops need to be arrested. I've said that before. And they need to be arrested now. And they're pay docked. And they're, and quite frankly, everything else docked until the trial and the verdict. I mean, that's how you do this kind of thing. So, you know, this is... You know, this is just, I don't know. But, you know, I'm just... Uh, horrified at what's happened with Jacob Blake. I'm glad he's alive. He's still fighting for life and he's alive and he looks like he's going to pull through. But my goodness me, um, my goodness, it, this, it's just, it's really too much. It, this, the videos and the, the families grieving over and over again every time. And I mean, I don't want to sound like I, I'm weary of it. I'm not. I, I'm just saying that it's such a sad thing. It really, truly is. And I just, my, I don't know. I really don't. Oh, my goodness. Well, look. Um, I think history is very important. I'm just saying that. And, it's, and how it comes around full circle. And also how it contrasts. Nobody really tries to bend Trump's ear anymore except Fox News now. I mean, it's really down to that. Uh, and, you know, it's it's just, anyway. We must keep fighting for Jacob Blake and many other people who have been shot and killed or shot and maimed by police. And I certainly believe that um, that we will be successful um, this November if, if we educate ourselves on voting and vote early and make sure that we are poll monitors. So very important, poll workers, very, very important. Find your poll worker or your poll worker office um, in, in one of the, uh, you know, in one of the websites, Secretary of State's websites. Wow, wow. So much more to talk about, but so little time, so I'll leave it there. RNC day number two in the books, night number two in the books, and we'll go to night number three tonight. Uh, Mike Pence is going to be one of the speakers and I'm sure Donald Trump will be there again. Oh, goodness. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. <laughs>